Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every Friday looking at the events of the past. Today on History Calling we're asking what happened to Edward V and Richard Duke of York, commonly known as the Princes in the Tower? Their disappearance from this veritable fortress after having been locked up there by their uncle Richard III in 1483 is often cited as the biggest royal mystery ever, certainly within the English royal family, and this topic has been one of my most highly requested videos. But why have historians never been able to satisfactorily explain the boy's fate, and what does the evidence really suggest happened? Stay tuned to learn about the final known movements of this one-time king and his little brother, the main suspects in their disappearance, the stories that at least one of them survived, and the multiple sets of remains discovered in the centuries after their disappearance, which some believe are the bones of the lost princes. I'll finish by telling you how at least part of the mystery could be solved using modern science, but why it's unlikely that this will ever happen. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on, and follow me on Instagram. There's a link for my account in the description box, along with some suggestions for other sources about the princes in the tower which you might find interesting. It's the 9th of April, 1483, and King Edward IV has just died, though the precise date of his passing is still debated. He leaves behind him his wife, the former Elizabeth Woodville, and their children, including their two sons, Edward and Richard. With his death, 12-year-old Prince Edward has now become King Edward V. Richard, who is the Duke of York, but who is also known as Richard of Shrewsbury in honour of his apparent birthplace, has moved up the line of succession to become the new heir to the throne. Young Edward is at Ludlow Castle in Shropshire, under the care of his maternal uncle, Anthony Woodville Earl Rivers. They receive the news of the King's death and Edward's accession on the 14th of April and set off for London on the 24th. On the way on the 29th of April at Northampton, Rivers meets up with the new King's paternal uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, brother to the late Edward IV. At some point, the sources are a little confused as to the chronology, Henry, Duke of Buckingham, also arrives. He's a cousin of Gloucester's, but also the husband of Elizabeth Woodville's sister, Catherine, and therefore yet another of Edward V's uncles. Also present is Edward V's half-brother, Richard Grey, born during Elizabeth Woodville's first marriage. The Duke of Gloucester doesn't get along well with his sister-in-law and her family. Elizabeth didn't inform him of Edward IV's death and is trying to ensure that she is made the protector of the realm during the minority of the new king, rather than Gloucester himself. This is despite the fact that the precedent set by earlier medieval minorities is that the protector is a man and a close relative of the king on his father's side, and that Edward IV's will appoints Gloucester to this rule. The group of men in Northampton dine together, though the new king is not there as he's lodged nearby in Stony Stratford, and then all retire for the night. The next day, the 30th of April, Gloucester has Rivers, Grey and their companion Sir Thomas Vaughan arrested on charges of treason and sent north, while he and Buckingham take custody of the new king. Meanwhile, Richard Duke of York is in London with his mother, sisters and other half-brother Thomas Grey, Marquess of Dorset. When the Dowager Queen hears what Gloucester and Buckingham have done, she takes all her remaining children and flees into sanctuary in Westminster Abbey on the 1st of May. Three days later, on the 4th of May, Edward V and his uncle Gloucester arrive in London and the following week Gloucester places his nephew in the Tower of London, ostensibly to prepare for his coronation, scheduled for the 22nd of June. He has oaths of allegiance sworn to the new king, something which he had done previously while still in the north, and this suggests that at this point he fully intends for Edward to hold the throne and for he himself to be nothing more than protector. Indeed, he is appointed so by the royal council, but only until the coronation. This ceremony will never occur though, for a catastrophe is looming for the York boys. Apparently on the 9th of June, again the exact chronology is a little fuzzy, at a meeting of the council held at Westminster Palace, Bishop Robert Stillington announces to those present that Edward V cannot be crowned king because he is illegitimate. 
Stillington claims that he himself married Edward IV to the English noblewoman Eleanor Talbot, daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury, several years before Edward married Elizabeth Woodville in 1464, and that the Woodville marriage was therefore void and its children have no claim on the throne. This makes the dead king's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, the real heir. Whether Edward IV had married Elizabeth bigamously is beyond the scope of this video, but there had been rumours to that effect for years, and it certainly seems possible that he had. However, given that Eleanor had died in 1468, before the birth of either Edward V or the Duke of York, Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth was arguably no longer bigamous by that point, as all it took to be married in this era was for both parties to agree publicly, which just means in front of witnesses, that they were wed, then sleep together. As Elizabeth was Edward's acknowledged consort and continued to have children by him, these criteria had been met. What matters in 1483, though, is that Stillington's information is believed by Gloucester and at least part of the council, or at least they claim to believe it, and that they are prepared to overlook the inconvenient fact of Eleanor's early death. The situation now develops rapidly. On the 13th of June, another council meeting is taking place in the Tower of London. Not all the councillors are present, but Gloucester, Buckingham and William Lord Hastings are there. Hastings is the man who had informed Gloucester of his brother's death and who had supported his claim to be protector, even telling him back in April to take charge of the boy king rather than leaving him with Earl Rivers and Richard Grey. Crucially though, he is not in favour of Gloucester actually replacing Edward V. In the middle of the meeting, Gloucester claims that Hastings and his men have brought concealed weapons into the room and that his person is in danger, for Hastings is supposedly in league with the Woodvilles against him. Hastings is dragged out and summarily executed without trial. Edward V's remaining half-brother, Thomas Grey, Marquis of Dorset, quickly flees to France, where he goes to the side of Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond. For more on that, see my video on the life of Henry VII Part 1, which I'll leave linked on screen and in the description box for you. On the 16th of June, Buckingham goes with the Archbishop of Canterbury to Westminster Abbey to persuade Elizabeth Woodville to release her youngest son, Richard Duke of York, so that he might join Edward V in the Tower prior to the coronation. We don't know exactly what was said at this meeting, but the upshot of it was that Elizabeth handed the boy over, with assurances that he would be well treated. One interpretation of her actions is that she trusted Gloucester would take good care of him. Another is that she was backed into a corner and had no option but to give him to Buckingham. She and her daughters remain in the Abbey, but she will never see either of her youngest sons again. The little Duke of York is now sent straight to the Tower. The next day, Gloucester announces that the coronation, which York had apparently needed to be released from sanctuary to attend, will be postponed by four months. On about the 20th of June, Edward and his siblings are declared illegitimate by a gathering known as the Three Estates of the Realm, made up of men who had congregated in London in anticipation of a parliament which was to have been opened by the young king after his coronation. Two days later, Friar Ralph Shaw, or Shaw, was asked to preach a sermon at Paul's Cross against the rights of illegitimate children. It is seen as a clear reference to the children of Edward IV by Elizabeth Woodville. On the 25th of June, the Queen's brother, Earl Rivers, her son, Richard Grey, and Sir Thomas Vaughan are executed here, at Pontefract Castle, on the almost certainly false charge that they had planned the death of Richard of Gloucester. That same day, Buckingham makes a speech here at the Guildhall in London, in which he publicly claims that the Woodville marriage is invalid. It has ostensibly taken a few days to persuade Gloucester to accept the throne, but he does so at his mother's home, Baynard Castle, on the 26th of June, becoming King Richard III. He is crowned alongside his wife, Anne Neville, on the 6th of July at Westminster Abbey. In a coronation rule referring to this ceremony, there exists a list of clothing items ordered for Lord Edward, son of late King Edward IV. This would certainly appear to be a reference to Edward V after he had been deposed and lost his title of king, but there is no evidence that he or his brother attended their uncle's coronation, and in fact, after the Duke of York entered the Tower on the 16th of June, neither brother is ever to be seen outside its walls again. There is an attempt to rescue them in July, but it fails. 
Were they even still alive at that point, however, and what might have happened to them, and when? A later chronicle, called the Great Chronicle of London, which was written between 1504 and 1512 by a man named Robert Fabian, recorded that during the mayoralty of Sir Edmund Shaw or Shaw, who happened to be the brother of the aforementioned Friar Ralph Shaw, and whose tenure as mayor of London ended on the 28th of October 1483, the children of King Edward were seen shooting, meaning practising archery, and playing in the garden of the tower at sundry times. There is no specific date given here, however, and so unfortunately it doesn't illuminate when exactly they were last seen at the tower, except that it was at least a few days after the Duke of York's arrival on the 16th of June, as we have a reference to children plural. We have only one contemporary source written by someone who was in England during the summer of 1483 and which discusses the fate of the former king and his brother. This is a report by an Italian scholar named Dominic Mancini which was sent to Angelo Cato, Archbishop of Vienne, in December 1483, though Mancini had actually left England back in July. The report is entitled The Usurpation of Richard III and in it Mancini says that after Hastings was removed, all the attendants who had waited on the king were debarred access to him. He and his brother were withdrawn into the inner apartments of the tower proper, and day by day began to be seen more rarely behind the bars and windows, till at length they ceased to appear altogether. The physician John Argentine, the last of his attendants whose services the king enjoyed, reported that the young king, like a victim prepared for sacrifice, sought remission of his sins by daily confession and penance, because he believed that death was facing him. The dating of Mancini's report, which was written before the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, and so wasn't affected by any knowledge of what would ultimately happen to Richard III, is one of its great strengths, as is the fact that he was tasked with writing as accurate a report as possible for his superior. He was also a foreigner who was, by December 1483, well beyond King Richard's grasp, and so didn't have to fear criticising the king in the way a resident of England might. The fact that he apparently had access to Edward V's doctor, John Argentine, is another mark in his favour, but his report also has its drawbacks. One is that Mancini didn't speak English himself, and his information must have come through a translator or translators, opening the way for possible misinterpretations. Another is that he wasn't in England after July 1483. Finally, all he really tells us is that the boys were still alive in mid to late June. Another source you may have heard of is the Seeley Note, so named because it is presumed to have been written by a man named George Seeley. It dates to some time before the 26th of June 1483, as it refers to the Duke of Gloucester who became King Richard III on that date, however we don't know how much earlier it was written. Among other things, it says, If the king, God save his life, were desert, meaning deceased. Much has been made of this comment as a possible reference to the fate of Edward V, but in reality, as we can't date the note, it might refer to Edward IV, and it doesn't really shed any light on the fate of the young Edward or Richard. So what did contemporaries in late 1483 and the decades afterwards think had happened to the two brothers who would eventually be dubbed by the Victorians, rather inaccurately it must be said, the Princes in the Tower. Though we have no solid evidence as to the fate of the boys, England and even mainland Europe were awash with rumours about what had happened to them during the 1480s and later. Mancini added in his report, which was made in December 1483, remember, that I have seen many men burst into tears and lamentations when mention was made of him, meaning Edward V, after his removal from men's sight, and already there is a suspicion that he had been done away with. Whether, however, he has been done away with, and by what manner of death, so far I have not yet at all discovered. The following month, the Chancellor of France reported that Richard had had his nephews killed. Not everyone blamed Richard, however, or at least they didn't blame only him. In a commonplace book, which was like a private notebook, which belonged to a London citizen and was written between 1483 and 88, there exists a comment that the boys, quote, were put to death in the Tower of London, be the vice, meaning by the advice, of the Duke of Buckingham. 
Interestingly, there was no official statement given during Henry VII's regime as to what had happened to his brothers-in-law, for he married their sister Elizabeth of York in 1486, and it is only in the reign of their son, Henry VIII, that we see the beginnings of a Tudor propaganda machine telling stories of his uncle's fates. When Richard III and his followers were attainted by Parliament in 1485, they were accused of treasons, homicides and murders in shedding of infants' blood. But this is one of the few governmental references to the children and to Richard being responsible for their deaths that we have, and it actually makes no specific mention of Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury. It was clearly a commonly held belief that Richard had been responsible for their deaths, however, though most of the 15th century sources we have which say this were written outside England or were not published at the time of writing. From the autumn of 1485, we have the Crowland Chronicle, which stated that the children, by some unknown manner of violent destruction, had met their fate. The following year, on the 1st of March, 1486, Diego de Valera told Ferdinand of Aragon and his wife Isabella of Castile that Richard had poisoned his nephews, though he also said that this had occurred during the lifetime of Edward IV, so I think we can discount him as a reliable source. Also in 1486, two poets named Pietro Carmeliano and Giovanni Giglis made reference to the brothers' fates. Carmeliano wrote that Richard savagely did away with these boys. Giglis said that Richard was steeped in the blood of his own family, and that his nephews were victims given up to the hideous god of the underworld. Yet another source from that year, this one written by a Burgundian chronicler named Jean Molinet, said that there was sacrifice to the god Mars, innocent children drawn from the royal stock. Three years later, John Roos claimed that the boys were dead within about three months of Edward being detained by his uncle Gloucester at Stony Stratford. This would place their deaths at the end of July or start of August. In the Bodleian Library in Oxford is an anonymously authored 15th century document which claimed that Richard, having first taken counsel with the Duke of Buckingham, removed them from the light of this world by some means or other, vilely and murderously. The recorder of Rotterdam, Jan Alerts, was a little more cautious in 1489, writing that Richard had killed two of his brother's children, boys, or so he was accused, while in 1490s France, writer Philippe de Comines made two conflicting claims, one that Richard had brought about the death of his nephews, the other that the Duke of Buckingham had done it and was soon after executed. This would place the deaths of the boys no later than October 1483, as Buckingham, for reasons which remain unclear, rebelled against Richard in that month and was executed on the 2nd of November. In 1496, a servant of the King of Portugal named Rue de Souza said that the boys had been bled to death, but a Danzig chronicler writing at around the same time merely said that King Richard had had them killed. Numerous sources also say that the boys were killed in June 1483. These include an undated manuscript held at Nottingham University Library, which says that Edward was slain and his body drowned in that month and the Lincoln Rule, which is a late 15th century genealogical chart now held at the Rylands Library, which claims that Edward died in June without issue. Such sources may be repeating the gossip common at the time, however, rather than having any reliable, independent information to back up their claims. In roughly 1497, an anonymous author, who may have been a man named Bernard André, wrote in the book The Twelve Triumphs of Henry VII that Richard was of such blunted feelings as to destroy his own nephews. In around 1500, we know that André, who was writing a history of Henry VII at the time, claimed that the tyrant also gave orders for his unguarded nephews in the Tower of London to be secretly put to the sword. It wasn't until around 1503 that a reference to what had happened was actually published. This was drawn from the commonplace book of one Richard Arnold, who said that the two sons of King Edward were put to silence. Then, by around 1504, we have the aforementioned Great Chronicle of London, penned by Robert Fabian, which claimed that after Easter 1484, there was much whispering among the people that the king had put the children of King Edward to death. He then gives one of the first really detailed accounts of what supposedly happened, saying, Of their deaths were many opinions, 
for some said that they were murdered between two feather beds, some said they were drowned in Malmsey, which is a type of wine, and some said that they were pierced with a venomous poison. But howsoever they were put to death, certain it was that before that day, meaning the arrival of Henry Tudor, they were departed from this world, of which cruel deed Sir James Tyrell was reported to be the doer, but others put that weight upon an old servant of King Richard's. This is the first time we ever hear of a specific person being blamed for the boy's death, Sir James Tyrell. Sir James had been executed in 1502, and though Fabian doesn't give a source for his information, for reasons which will become apparent in a minute, it has been speculated that perhaps it came from Tyrell himself, before he was killed. At around this time, Fabian was also working on another publication, ultimately known as the New Chronicles of England and France, and published in 1516, in which he said that, King Edward V, with his brother the Duke of York, were put under sure keeping within the tower, in such ways that they never came abroad after. He followed this statement up by adding that, The common fame went that King Richard had, within the tower, put unto secret death the two sons of his brother Edward IV, for the which and other causes had, within the breast of the Duke of Buckingham, the said Duke in secret manner conspired against him, and allied him with divers gentlemen, to the end to bring his purpose about. In this version, Buckingham is therefore credited with rebelling, in part due to his disgust at King Richard's handling of the children. We now return to Jean Molinet, who decided to revise his chronicle some time before the end of 1506, and who now gave a more detailed account of what had supposedly happened to the boys, which mirrors many of the details found in Fabian's work. He said that after being held prisoner for five weeks, they were killed by the captain of the tower and offered two causes of death. Either they were put into a dungeon without air, water or food, or, just as Fabian claimed may have happened, they were suffocated between two feather beds. In Molinet's account, though, the nine-year-old Richard wakes up to see what is happening and begs for his elder brother to be spared, and for he, Richard, to be killed in his place. The bodies were supposedly then buried in one secret location, before later being moved to another after Richard III had died, though the fact that Henry VII never produced any remains or pointed to a grave makes me doubt this. In 1512-13, yet another writer, Polydore Virgil, was drafting a book called Anglica Historia, or History of England, which would not be published until 1534. In this, he said that while Richard was on a post-coronation tour of England, he decided to kill his nephews, for as long as they were safe he could by no means be free of danger. Therefore he wrote a letter to Robert Brackenbury, the governor of the Tower of London, commanding him to find some honourable way of quickly killing his nephews. But the governor of the Tower of London, when he received the king's horrid instructions, was astonished at the atrocity of the thing, and feared that should he comply, he would some day be called to account. So he did not do this immediately, hoping the king would spare the boys because of their kindred blood or their age, or would change his dire plan. But so far was he from achieving either of these things, since Richard's mind remained unmoved, that as soon as he learned the governor had put off doing as he was bidden, he assigned this task to another man, James Tyrell. Compelled to do the deed, he sadly went to London and killed the royal children, setting an example nearly unheard of within human memory. Thus Prince Edward died, together with his brother Richard, but it is unknown what manner of death the poor little boys suffered. Richard, set free by this deed from his care and fear, did not long conceal the murder, and a few days later allowed the rumour of the boy's death to go abroad, as is reasonable to think, because, after the people had learned that Edward's male issue was extinct, they would be more tolerant of his own government. Finally, we come to one of the most famous accounts of the deaths of the boys, that written by Thomas Moore, one of Henry VIII's ministers, in his unfinished History of King Richard III. This too is very detailed and was written during the 1510s, though unpublished until 1557. Moore claimed that whilst at Gloucester on his post-coronation tour, Richard decided to rid himself of his nephews to better secure his grip on the throne. He sent a man named John Green to the tower with a letter for its constable, Sir Robert Brackenbury, telling him to put the boys to death, but Brackenbury refused. Richard then sent Sir James Tyrell to do the job, 
dispatching him to the tower with another letter for Brackenberry, instructing him to turn over to Tyrell all the keys to the building. Once he had these keys, Tyrell decided to kill the boys the next night in their beds. Their servants had been removed and they were now under the care of four men, including one named Miles Forrest. Forrest, along with John Dighton, who was Tyrell's horsekeeper, was appointed to carry out the deed and at midnight they stole into the boys' room and smothered them in their bed linens, pillows and feather beds. Once they were dead, their killers stripped them and brought in Tyrell to view the bodies. Then he caused those murderers to bury them at the stair foot meekly deep in the ground under a great heap of stones. Moore adds that King Richard was delighted with the news, but ordered that the boys should be buried somewhere better on account of their royal blood. They were therefore disinterred and Brackenberry had a priest secretly bury them in another place, the location of which was lost after the priest's death. Unlike other sources, Moore does specifically say that this information came from an interrogation of Tyrell as well as Dighton, which was conducted in the Tower in 1502 when Tyrell was under arrest for treason against Henry VII. He notes that his information had therefore come from them that knew much and little cause had to lie. He also acknowledged at the start of his account that his story didn't match every tale he'd ever heard of Edward and Richard's ends, but added, I have so heard by such men and by such means as me thinketh it were hard, but it should be true. In a 2020 article by historian Tim Thornton, details in the description box, he surmises that Moore may have read and been influenced by Fabian and Virgil's work, but also notes that, though only five years old in 1483, in the 1510s Moore would have had access to people who were adults at the time, including perhaps Dighton, and to their children. Other historians have wondered if some of the characters in Moore's work were fabricated, but Thornton believes they were likely real enough. There are other writings which we can look at too, which discuss what happened to the princes. The Chronicle of John Harding, published in 1543, claimed, Some say that King Richard caused the priest to take them up and close them in lead, and to put them in a coffin full of holes, hooked at the ends with two hooks of iron, and so to cast them into a place called the Black Deeps at the Thames' mouth, so that they should never rise up nor be seen again. There is also, famously, William Shakespeare, whose play, The Tragedy of King Richard III, discusses the, quote, pitiful murder of his innocent nephews. But as this work was written in the 1590s and based on one or more of the sources already mentioned, it is not of use to us here. So what solid conclusions can we draw from this mess of evidence, unsubstantiated rumour and comments made years, even decades after the fact? The answer is, not many. The boys were last seen at least a few days and perhaps a few weeks after the arrival of little Richard of Shrewsbury at the Tower of London on the 16th of June, but nothing else about their fate can be ascertained for certain. We do know, however, that by the end of the year it was widely suspected within England and abroad that they were dead, and that King Richard was the prime suspect, with blame sometimes apportioned to Buckingham as well. This is really as far as the sources can take us, however. Even the stories told by Fabian, Virgil and Moore are hearsay and conjecture, for there is no first-hand account of the interrogation of Tyrell and Dighton upon which they appear and even purport to be based. We cannot even be sure that one or both of the boys died. There continue to be rumours well into the 1490s that at least one, usually Richard of Shrewsbury, had somehow escaped, and this gave rise to a number of pretenders claiming to be him most notably Perkin Warbeck, who was ultimately executed by Henry VII for continuing the sham. These rumours were given fresh life in the 21st century by the historical fiction novels of Philippa Gregory, who used this idea as a plotline. Personally, I find this highly unlikely. Without a helicopter, the Tower of London would be tricky to get out of even today if all the entrances were locked, and while the odd person did escape from it in the past, we're talking about two little boys here who were very well guarded. My personal belief is that they died there, most likely during the summer of 1483, though I wouldn't like to speculate on a cause of death as I find all the supposed methods, whether poison, suffocation or drowning, to be equally plausible. If they did die though, who are the main suspects in their killings? Let's start with the most obvious candidate, Richard III. 
The boys were undoubtedly in his care, supposedly under his protection, and he benefited the most from their assumed deaths by securing the throne of England with no other heir except his own son, Edward of Middleham, who died in April 1484. Through his deceased brother, George Duke of Clarence, he did have another nephew, the Earl of Warwick, but that boy had already been stripped of his claim to the throne at the time of Clarence's disgrace and execution in 1478. Richard never offered any explanation as to the whereabouts or fate of his nephews, never produced them despite the very damaging rumours all across Europe that he had killed them, never had any bodies buried under their names, and failed to order any investigation into their disappearance. All the things we would expect to have happened if they were perfectly fine and still in his custody, if they died of natural causes, or if someone else had caused them harm without his consent. For my money, he is by far the most likely candidate in their demise. Let's not forget that he'd already had their uncle Earl Rivers, one of their Grey brothers, and Lord Hastings, one of the leading lords of the realm and a great supporter of Edward V, killed. Richard was no teddy bear. Next up, we have the Duke of Buckingham. His motive for killing the boys could be twofold either to help secure Richard's position or to bring himself one step closer to the throne as he had his own, albeit distant, claim to it, being a descendant of Edward III. However, this second motive is weak. If he'd killed the children to help advance his own claim, he would still have had to kill Richard, Richard's son, the Earl of Warwick, the sons of Edward IV and Richard III's sister, Elizabeth Duchess of Suffolk, and possibly even all the girls on the York line too, so that they couldn't pass their claims on to their eventual sons. That's a long list. Furthermore, the idea that he could penetrate the tower and kill the boys without Richard's consent is pretty laughable and would have been akin to signing his own death warrant. In the highly unlikely event that he had done so, why did Richard not announce the fact, especially after Buckingham's rebellion, and put the blame on him? In fact, even if Buckingham didn't do it, why didn't Richard just use him as a scapegoat anyway, unless he felt that to do so would be dishonourable? And no one wouldn't think that a child murderer would have a concept of honour, but people's minds work in funny ways. Lastly, if getting the throne for himself was the goal, why did Buckingham join in a rebellion in 1483 with the aim of putting Henry Tudor there, ultimately failing and getting himself executed? Despite being their uncle by marriage, he may well have advised Richard to have the boys killed, as was suspected by some at the time, but I don't think he murdered them or had them murdered himself. Third, we have Henry Tudor, the future Henry VII. This theory relies on the idea that the boys were still alive in 1485 when he returned from a lengthy exile in France and took the throne after the Battle of Bosworth. He then supposedly had them killed, as they had a better claim to the throne than he did, especially as he needed to re-legitimise them and their siblings so that he could marry their sister Elizabeth and bolster his own and their children's claim to the throne through her descent from Edward IV. I find Henry as a suspect to be a serious stretch, though. The boys were thought to be dead by the autumn of 1483 by virtually everyone, including their mother, and it isn't hard to see why. The Tower of London is huge and relies, then and now, on a large staff to keep it secure and running. Even with the boys' personal servants removed, there must have been rumours amongst the other soldiers and workers within the building that they were dead. Food would no longer have been sent to their rooms, laundry would no longer have been coming out, and they weren't appearing at the windows anymore. The idea that they were still there two years later doesn't hold water to my mind, and I'm unaware of anyone at the time accusing Henry of having them killed, unless they believe that Perkin Warbeck was really Richard of Shrewsbury. Furthermore, Henry never produced any bodies, though if the boys had died just after he took the throne, he could have blamed it on last-minute orders from Richard, and he allowed Clarence's son, the Earl of Warwick, who also had a better blood claim to the throne than him, to live on until 1499, only killing him at that point because he tried to escape the tower. If Henry had had bodies, or even a grave to produce in later years, I also think he would have done so in order to stem the tide of pretenders claiming to be one of his brothers-in-law. Last and least believable of all to me is Henry Tudor's mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort. Again, I'm unaware of any contemporary ever saying that she had anything to do with the boys' disappearance or deaths. This story has been popularised by the fictionalised accounts of the events of the 1480s written by novelist Philippa Gregory, 
but there's not a shred of primary evidence to support it. Like the Duke of Buckingham theory, there are also practical problems and lapses in logic which make this scenario extraordinarily unlikely. If Margaret had had anything to do with the boys' deaths, why didn't Richard say so? How would she, or rather her hired help, have accessed the tower and killed two well-guarded prisoners? And why would she do this? It's easy to forget that Henry Tudor taking the throne is one of the great unforeseen plot twists of history. In the summer of 1483, the chances that he would do so were pathetically small. His mother had actually joined the household of the new queen, Anne Neville, and had been angling for him to come back to England slash Wales and have his title of Earl of Richmond officially restored to him. Yes, she did play a serious role in the plot, commonly called the Buckingham Plot, of October 1483 to oust Richard, but as the authors of her entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, Michael K. Jones and Malcolm G. Underwood say, she likely did so because she believed the boys already dead at Richard's hands. She also had the backing of Elizabeth Woodville, who certainly wouldn't have joined forces with Margaret if she'd heard even a whiff of a rumour that Margaret had killed her boys. Decades passed, and it seemed as though there was nothing more to be said or discovered about Edward V and his brother Richard of Shrewsbury. However, multiple sets of remains found in the Tower of London in the centuries since their supposed deaths have been claimed as theirs. In 1610, historian George Buck wrote that the remains of what was apparently a child were found in a high, desolate turret. Some suspected it was one of the boys. Others thought that it was an ape, which isn't as crazy as you might think because the tower was actually used as a zoo between the 13th and 19th centuries. In 1622, another historian, Ralph Brooke, said that the children's dead carcasses were there found under a heap of stones and rubbish. In 1647, one John Webb, who worked for the Surveyor of the King's Works, wrote that, sometime between 1603 and 1614, the wall of the passage to the King's lodgings, then sounding hollow, was taken down and was found a little room about seven or eight feet square wherein stood a table, and upon it the bones of two children, supposed of six or eight years of age, which by the aforesaid nobles and all present were credibly believed to be the carcasses of Edward V and his brother, the then Duke of York. These reports may all refer to the same bones, but based on Webb's information, they would appear to be too young to be Edward and Richard, aged 12 and 9 in 1483. To complicate matters further, another report says that this discovery occurred during Elizabeth I's reign, and that these were the same bones which were later famously discovered on the 17th of July, 1674. On that day, two sets of bones were found in a wooden chest by workmen working on a staircase in the tower. They were ten feet down, under a pile of stones, or as another source puts it, deep interred under the rubbish of the stairs that led up into the chapel of the White Tower. They were damaged during this discovery, especially the smaller skull, largely because, not realising what they had, the workmen threw the bones into a rubbish heap, then had to go back afterwards and sift through it to retrieve them. They were, however, felt to be the bones of two children aged about 13 and 11, and according to an urn they were later placed in, they were identified as the boys by most certain tokens. What these tokens were is not disclosed. Other sources say there were scraps of velvet with them, but this would not tally with Moore's assertion that they were buried unclothed, unless perhaps they were wrapped in a cloth or cloths. They were also presumed to be the lost princes in the tower because they were found beneath the staircase and this partially matched information Thomas Moore had given, though he said they'd been moved from such a location. A location near the Tower Chapel, however, might have been considered a place of honour for their burial if Richard III really did ask for the bones to be moved to a higher status place after their initial interment. There's no reason to suppose, after all, that they weren't buried under one staircase, then moved to another. Interestingly, from the information I've read, this memorial plaque is actually not in the correct location, as it is indoors and the discovery was seemingly made outside. The remains were initially placed in the care of Sir Thomas Chichley, the Master of the Ordnance, and with the exception of a few bones sent to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, they were apparently deposited in the tomb of General Monk in Westminster Abbey in around February 1675. Then, in 1678, King Charles II had them interred in this elaborate urn in the wall of the Henry VII Chapel in the Abbey. 
The bones sent to the museum had disappeared by January 1729, and when the urn was opened in 1933, it was discovered that the human bones were mixed in with the remains of small animals, including chickens and fish, which might suggest either that they had been included to cover up the removal of the real bones, or that these animal bones became mixed in with the skeletons when they were thrown on the rubbish heap back in 1674. The examination in July 1933 found that numerous bones were missing, but there was, quote, a fairly complete skull and a portion of another lay on top. Gender was not ascertained, but some vertebrae were found which were used to provide an age of less than 13 for the elder child. Only the lower half of the right side of the jaw was found for the younger child, but the teeth remaining and those in the larger skull were also used to estimate ages for the skeletons which corresponded with Edward V and Richard Duke of York's ages in 1483. Their heights were estimated at 4 feet 10 inches and 4 feet 6 and a half inches using, quote, collarbones, shoulder blades and hip bones, and they were of slim build. The examiners, who included medical doctors and dentists, also felt that some similarities in the formation of the skulls and teeth suggested a familial link between the deceased individuals. The older child had suffered from considerable dental decay, which the examiners felt must have been painful and impacted their general health, and there was a red-brown stain, quote, reaching from just below the orbits to the angles of the lower jaw, which was assumed to be blood and was attributed to the child being suffocated. Those who studied the bones felt certain that they had found the so-called princes in the tar, though in actual fact none of their observations amounted to conclusive evidence of that. There is one final twist in the tale of the bodies supposedly belonging to Edward V and Richard Duke of York. In 1789, the tomb of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville was found here at St George's Chapel, Windsor. Another vault was discovered nearby, which was thought to hold the remains of two of their lesser-known children, George, Duke of Bedford, who died in 1479 as a toddler, and Princess Mary, who died aged 14 in 1482, and a slab was put up to record that untested assumption. However, St George's Chapel had not been completed yet when little George died, and in 1810, two further coffins were found beneath what is now the Albert Memorial Chapel. One of these clearly stated that it contained George's remains, and we know from contemporary records that his sister Mary was buried next to him. Because of the presence of the slab near the tomb of their parents, and the fact that George and Mary were moved to a vault next to their father and mother in 1813, some confusion has arisen, and there has been speculation that young Edward and Richard might be buried next to their parents' vault as well. In actual fact, it's all just a misunderstanding. There might well be no coffins in this adjacent vault, and if there are, there is no reason to think they would belong to the missing boys. To conclude, we are never going to know for sure what happened to the princes in the tower, but on the basis of what evidence there is, I think the most likely scenario is that, on the orders of their uncle, Richard III, they were killed sometime between late June and September 1483. The cause of death cannot be reliably guessed at, but smothering, drowning, poison and starvation are all possible. As for whether the bones found at the tower in 1674 are the boys, we simply don't know, but it seems highly possible considering that they are the skeletal remains of two children of about the right ages and were found together in an area which wouldn't have usually been used for a grave, suggesting considerable secrecy around their interment. If the bones were to be subjected to a modern analysis, much more information about them could hopefully be gathered. Carbon dating would hopefully tell us roughly when they died, while DNA, assuming that DNA could be gathered from such ancient remains, which isn't always possible, would tell us if the skeletons were male, if they were brothers, and if they were the nephews of Richard III. The mitochondrial DNA of their mother, Elizabeth Woodville, has also been established using the DNA of a descendant of one of her sisters, and that too could be used to confirm the boy's identity as Elizabeth's sons. In particular, this would be helpful if, unlikely though it is, one or both of the children were Elizabeth's but not her husband's, and therefore not Richard III's nephews. And remember that we have Richard III's DNA because his body was found under a car park back in 2012. Lastly, an examination of such bones as are remaining would also hopefully tell us at about what ages the individuals died, and this could exonerate Henry VII from any suspicion of killing them in 1485 or later. 
Unfortunately, such an examination cannot be carried out without the express permission of the current monarch, and this has not been forthcoming since 1933, despite repeated requests. If you've made it to the end of this video, well done. You deserve a gold star. It was so long. Please remember to give it a thumbs up and to subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on and let me know in the comments what you think happened to the princes in the tower and how likely you think it is that the bones found in 1674 and now in Westminster Abbey are actually them. I'll be back next week with a new, much shorter video and until then, keep learning.